Hello and welcome to the Civil Times. Today we will be analyzing the editorials of 30th January 2019. These are the articles we will be covering today. Now before we start the lecture, I would like to tell all the viewers of this lecture to first go and read these editorials yourself because it is only your own effort that will help you sail through UPSC rather than relying on somebody else. Therefore, to reiterate, first of all, go and read these articles from the newspaper yourself. Try and understand as much as you can and only then attend this lecture. Moving forward, first we'll be covering the editorial in Hindu. The first editorial today is Think Universal Basic Capital. A simplistic universal basic income will not solve the fundamental problems of the Indian economy. What the author is basically trying to tell through this editorial is that despite India's great performance economically where he says that India's GDP has been growing quite well yet there is lots that need to be done to improve the overall human development in India. Now to do this the government is mooting a universal basic income through which cash will be transferred to all the individuals which will help them access the basic services that are needed such as health education now before we begin the article let us try and understand what is a universal basic income a basic income basically means the three characteristics rather of basic income would be first of all a basic income is a periodic cash transfer done to all individuals so that they can access quality public services moreover there is no means test requirement that is these are not conditional these are universal that is what is meant by a universal basic income therefore the characteristics are it is periodic cash transfer it is transferred to all the individuals there is no mean test requirement and it is done so that the individuals can afford or access quality public services now what is the author saying in this article the author says that India despite performing well economically which is reflected in the growing GDP India needs to needs to do much better to improve overall human development in which it continues to be compared with countries in the sub-saharan Africa even its poorer subcontinental neighbors such as Bangladesh and Sri Lanka are improving health and education faster he says benefits of India's economic growth must trickle down much faster to people at the bottom of the pyramid which is the poor of farmers the landless rural neighbors the hundreds of millions of workers living on the edge in low paying flexible forms of employment with no social security that is the author is basically saying that the benefits of India's growth must trickle down faster to the people at the bottom of the pyramid which are the farmers you have the rural landless labor and then you have the millions who are employed 
in the informal sector of the Indian economy. What is the informal sector? In brief, informal sector is basically that which is not regulated, not regulated by the government. Moreover, the wages here are not taxed. And another point, most of the Indian workers are basically employed in the informal sector. Moving further, the author says that the economists to cater to this problem of lack of human development suggest three solutions. First, they say that there is no problem at all. First, second, they say that more privatization, more privatization will lead to much more growth which will later on trickle down to the masses which is basically the capitalist theory the third solution they offer is a universal basic income which shall be provided by the state now the author tackles each one of these solutions one by one he says that first of all the first problem to those economists who say there is no problem he says that despite the fact that the economists agree that the Indian economy is growing at a fast pace however the economists even admit that a lot more must be done to improve the development front of the Indian economy which is such as the education and the healthcare moreover to address the persistent informality as we've discussed before the second issue which he says the second solution that is offered by the economist is more privatization he says, the author says that the private sector is basically driven by the profit motive and they are not designed to provide affordable public services equitably. That is, the private sector will not take the burden of subsidizing citizens who cannot pay for their services. Basically, the private sector is driven by the profit motive and it will not take interest in providing services to those who cannot afford to pay for them. Then he comes on to the third solution, which is being mooted by the government in the upcoming budget. He says, <coughs> he says, first of all, <coughs> that structural forces within the global economy have been driving down wages and creating insecure employment. We'll see why this is happening further in the article while increasing the mobility of capital and increasing incomes which come from ownership of capital. This is the basic socialist theory and this article you'll find it is basically based upon the socialist philosophy. He says the industry four, which is the fourth industrial revolution. We shall deal with this later on, which has not yet spread too far is expected to worsen these problems. An economic consequence of declining growth of wage incomes will be reduction of consumption. For who will buy all the material and services that these systems will produce? Therefore, UBI, which is universal basic income, has been has appeared as a silver bullet solution. According to the proponents, the beauty of universal basic income is first of all it avoids messy political questions about who deserves assistance sidesteps the challenges of actually providing the services required just give the people the cash and they shall buy what they need however according to the author merely giving cash will not provide citizens with good quality and affordable education and health because neither the government nor the private sector is willing to do this therefore the human development problem will not be solved by merely providing a universal basic income Moreover, he says, the universal basic income is neither politically nor financially feasible. Therefore, the idea of universal basic in income in India, which was mooted by, which was suggested by Arvind Subramaniam, the former chief economic advisor to the government, has even proposed diluting the original idea of UBI to QBRI, Q -U -B -R -I, which stands for quasi-universal basic rural income that is the idea of basic income will be targeted only at the poorer people in rural areas 
now first it will exclude the not so poor in the rural areas which is correct morally according to the author second it will not cover the masses of urban poor working for low and uncertain wages therefore some other schemes will have to be drawn up for the urban sector all the schemes rural and urban could be cash transfer with which aadhar and the digitization of financial services will facilitate however this still begs the question how to provide good quality public services for the poor to buy basically the author is saying that the idea of cubery which is basically a dilution which is basically a dilution of ubi is fine however it's the question remains that will merely providing cash to the poor will lead them to accessing good quality public services that is who is going to provide these good quality services for the poor to buy with the cash they are given therefore he says a simplistic ubi will not solve the fundamental problems of the indian economy he says an unavoidable solution to fix india's fundamental problems is the strengthening of institutions of state to deliver the services of the state moreover these services must be available to all the citizens regardless of their ability to pay them the state must the institution strengthening must also be done so that they can regulate the delivery of services by the private sector and moreover it can ensure fair competition in the market it will also require stronger management administrative and political capabilities further he says now he comes to the question of economic inequality some economists say that inequality does not matter so long as poverty is being reduced he says the author says inequality is necessary to reduce sorry the most of the economists the author here is saying that most of the economists propound that inequality does not matter so long as the poverty is being reduced moreover they also say that in fact inequality is necessary to reduce poverty however the author says that it is economic inequality still matters it matters because it increases the social and political inequalities that is he says economic inequality basically translates to social and political inequalities how those with more wealth change the rules of the game to protect it and increase their wealth and power thus the opportunities for progress become unequal this is why economic inequality must be reduced to create a must more just society in the present economic system people at the top can make more profits by driving down prices and wages for people at the bottom they may then recycle a small portion of their profits back as philanthropy or corporate social responsibility or or the other thing that the corporates can do is pay the state more taxes so that with these taxes the state shall be able to provide more services to the people at bottom and even a ubi now this portion is the structural forces that the author was talking about here yeah. that is the structural forces basically the institutions which are controlled by the wealthy and the powerful who with their profit motive in mind drive down the wages and create insecure employment rules basically he says that in economic inequality matters and must be reduced to create a more just society now the terms of trade uh now further the author proposes rather than universal basic income a universal basic capital when the people shall hold own the wealth they generate as shareholders of their collective enterprise such as the amul the seva or the gramin which have shown away 
basically suggesting the cooperative way rather than the corporate private sector way to increase the development front of India. To conclude, now the author provides solution to the problems, the three problems he had mentioned earlier. He says three better solutions to create more equitable growth than the ones on offer are first basically building state capacity that is strengthening the uh, government institutions as we've discussed here. Second he says strengthening the missing middle level institutions which calls for aggregation of tiny enterprises and representation of workers. Here the author says that to basically to compete or not compete basically as a counterpart to the structural forces who are the wealthy the workers must be organized the unorganized workers must be aggregated into smaller or larger associations cooperatives and unions so that they can negotiate more fair terms this is what he's saying he's proposing is a second solution which is strengthening the missing middle institutions for aggregation of tiny enterprises and representation of workers. Third, he says that the universal basic capital theory must be applied rather than universal basic income. Universal basic capital is basically where the people own the wealth they generate as shareholders of their collective enterprise rather than the current way, the corporate way. I hope this article is clear. It's pretty straightforward. Now, next, we move to the editorials of the Indian Express. The first article here is Toxic Plants. Waste to energy plants that use solid waste as feedstock for serious threat to health and environment. We wish we could scream loud enough for our readers and the municipal authorities. Here, what the author is saying is that waste to energy plants, what are waste to energy plants, first of all? Waste to energy plants, basically, what they do is they collect the solid waste which is generated in India the second article is toxic plants waste energy plants that use solid waste as feedstock for serious threat to health and environment the author here is talking about the waste to energy plants in India which are pro proposed as a good solution to tackle the problem of solid waste in India are basically resulting in worsening of air quality and incessant and increasing air pollution. Now first of all, what is a solid waste problem? The problem in India is that there are 377 million people living in the urban India who generate 62 million tons according to the government 62 million tons of municipal solid wastes every year according to the government 1240 hectares of landfill shall be needed per year if the waste remains unattended now waste to energy plants were proposed as a great solution to tackle the problem of rising solid urban waste what are these waste to energy plants what these plants basically do is they collect the waste solid waste and then these are burned in the process of incineration this the heat generated from this is used to boil water which generates steam which is used to turn turbines which finally generates power. This is the basic mechanism of waste to energy plants. Now what the author is saying that these waste to energy plants which burn mixed way result in pollution of the environment and worsening of air quality. Waste energy plants which use inadequately segregated municipal, municipal waste as feedstock the waste to energy plants in India in our cities which use inadequately segregated municipal waste as feedstock 
are highly dangerous because of the toxic gases and the particulates they spew when they burn mixed waste in the process of incineration. Here they provide a case study of Delhi. The three, how the three waste to energy plants in Delhi are leading to worsening of the air quality and uh, threat to health and environment of the residents living over there. Now, this author says there are five municipal waste to energy plants which are operational in India with a total capacity to produce 66.4 megawatts of electricity per day, of which the lion's share, which is 52 megawatts per day, is generated in Delhi by the three existing plants. Moreover, there is also a talk of further expansion, and which is a setting up of a new waste to energy plant with capacity of 25 megawatt at Thekhand in southeast Delhi. Now, waste to energy plants in India burn mixed waste. The presence of chlorinated hydrocarbons like PVC results in the release of dioxins and furans when the waste is burned at less than 850 degrees Celsius. That is, the mixed waste when burned at temperatures less than 850 degrees Celsius results in the release of dioxins and furans which are known to be carcinogenic carcinogenic which means these are cancer causing or they can also lead to impairment of the immune endocrine which is uh, the hormone system the nervous and the reproductive systems moreover they are extremely difficult and costly to measure now the author compares the the compares the situation in India with the situation in the West. She says, the author says, that even people living in the neighborhood of the best maintained plants in the West are said to be prone to higher levels of cancer and other illnesses. That is why the waste to energy plants are being phased out in the West. However, in India, they have acquired a clamor. There's an increasing clamor for waste to energy plants. Next, the solid waste management rules. What are the solid waste management rules? First of all, we'll study what are the solid waste management rules. These were basically notified by the Indian government in 2016. It basically, uh, the most important points would be the rules talk about the rules mandate segregation of waste, segregation of waste at source, door to door collection of waste and decentralized waste processing. At even small habitations. Now, according to the Solid Waste Management Rules of 2016, these require that PVC should be phased out in the incinerators by April 2018. But it is impossible to identify and remove the PVC beverage labels, for example, from mixed waste streams. Moreover, these waste to energy plants in India are also inefficient in generating energy. Municipal waste in India has a very high biodegradable wet waste content ranging from anywhere between 60 to 70 percent of the total as compared to 30 percent in the West. This results in the waste, municipal waste in India having a high moisture content and low calorific value. Calorific value. Moreover, the India's solid waste management policy requires that wet and dry waste should not be mixed so that only the non-compostable and non-recyclable waste with at least 1500 kilocalorie per kg should reach the waste to energy plants. Such waste comprises only 10-15% to of the total waste. 
The challenge of segregation at source is further compounded by the use of compactors to transport, to reduce the transport cost of waste used by the municipal government. What compacting does is it compresses the waste and makes even gross segregation at the plant site impossible. Moreover, it becomes, this leads, this makes it necessary for the waste energy plant to use auxiliary fuel which adds to the cost of operating the plants. The private companies, which are mostly foreign, are keenly hawking the waste energy solution to handle our growing volumes of urban waste. Our urban local bodies are also easily misguided into adopting these solutions because they are themselves reluctant to make an effort at keeping the wet and dry waste, recyclable and non-recyclable waste unmixed. They find the waste to energy plants an easy option to legitimize the burning of mixed waste. Municipal authorities should be made aware that waste to energy plants are being faced. Now the author proposes a few solutions. She says the municipal authorities should be made aware that the waste, waste to energy technologies are being phased out in the West. They should not be allowed unless the waste offered meets the criterion specified by Solid Waste Management Rules of 2016. A crucial element of enforcement will be to first ensure that waste is not mixed at the source of generation. Moreover, the handling of waste further is done in unmixed streams. To summarize, basically in the entire article, the author basically points out that waste to energy plants are leading to worsening of air quality and, and, threats, and threats to health and environment. And a solution, as a solution, she points out that the wastes must be handled separately. That is, there should be separation of waste. And further, uh, she proposes exploring low-cost options such as composting and biomethanation. Moreover, there should be no mixing of waste either at the point of generation or further down the stream. The second editorial in the Indian Express is Paul Economics and this basically deals with the idea of the, B the BJP sorry The second article from the Indian Express is Poll Economics, which basically talks about which basically talks about the promises of universal basic income and minimum income being proposed by the politicians ahead of the upcoming elections in 2019 as a way to garner votes. Now he says that whether the idea of these minimum income which is being proposed by Congress as a way to counter and combat the ruling BJP's brand of social welfareism which is universal basic scheme which, which according to the author might be announced or unveiled in the interim budget this week. He says that this idea of minimum income or the UBI whether it is good for politics that is not sure that only the elections will tell but it certainly rests on dodgy economics. The idea of UPI was mooted by the former chief economic advisor Arvind Subramaniam who had proposed it in the 2017 economic survey. And it has a good appeal. The objective of UPI is basically to ensure social justice and dignity, reducing poverty and increasing administrative efficiency. However, the author says there are multiple challenges with the implementation of UBI. First of all, he says, the cost of funding such a scheme would be huge and in India with a huge population the cost of funding the UBI could be even more than 2% of the GDP. Moreover the other challenge would be how to define poverty and determining an appropriate threshold. Next the, another challenge could be the identif identification of beneficiaries. Such a scheme shall make sense only when the state is able to replace a wide range of other welfare schemes including the Mandrager as well with the UBI. 
The current economic narrative coming as it does after the loan waivers announced by many states should be a reason to worry considering that the signs of economic recovery are still fragile after the twin disruptions of the note ban and the GST. Moreover, this race between the Congress and BJP to provide better Moreover, this race between the Congress and BJP pose, to provide a better option for the poor poses a, great, a grave threat to the fiscal and financial stability of the country. This wasn't a very important article. It deals with UBA. You can take certain points from this article for your mates. Thank you. That's all for today. Thank you.